Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> We've got that uh, that documentary back there, Being Baptist. How many? Pretty much everybody in here has seen that, I assume, and grabbed one today to take out. I, uh, I thought, you know, I like to have one of those handy because sometimes people ask, now, what do Baptists believe? And you try to explain it to them, and they're kind of confused on that. Remember one guy? Remember one guy in Iola? I was talking to him, and he said, "Now, are you Baptist?" Or are you Christian? And I was like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I tried to explain to him what that, what that means. And he's, he said, uh, and I remember another guy, maybe the same guy, I can't remember, but he said he was Church of Christ. He said, I just think that we need to be Church of Christ because Christ started the church. And I was like, well, amen, Christ started the church, you're right. <laughs> so I don't think people understand what it means. You know, like I just chose to be Baptist, right? And then there's a particular particular. Uh, uh, lineup of things that I believe, you know, and to some degree that's true. And I, I, on the way up here, I listened to that documentary again on, well, I looked it up on YouTube because I, I couldn't remember exactly what was taught as far as what are the uh, Baptist uh, kind of distinctives, right? I remember hearing this in Bible college um, and, and there's a couple different versions of it, but it was an acronym, Baptist, you know, and the B stood for biblical authority, you know, and I might mess this up. Like I said, there's, there's, there's more than one, uh, uh, you know, version of this, but B was uh, biblical authority and the, the A was like autonomy of the uh, local church and, and the P was priesthood of the believers and the first T was uh, two or uh, two, uh, what do you call it? Uh, we don't want to say sacraments. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> two uh, ordinances, and then the and then it was two. Uh, I mean, so, so that's the T. Then you had uh, uh, what? What is the I? Uh, individual soul liberty. I think some some versions say. And then uh, uh, and then the other uh, S is like separation of church and state. Amen about that. <laughs> and then the last T was two off. I mean, two offices, right? So the first T was two ordinances. Last one is two offices. Well, the thing is, like, those sound good, but they're really not, number one, a creed. It's not really right, I don't think, for a Baptist who's an independent Baptist to have, like, a set of... I mean, it's okay to say, hey, these are some things we agree upon. These are the, the essentials that we want to hold to. Uh, I understand that, but to say, like, all right, this is what everybody who's a Baptist has to believe, guess what you'd be starting then? You'd be starting a denomination. Right, we're not a denomination. So, like at some point way back, they came up with the London Confessions, and uh, people say, "Well, we're a confessional Baptist or something like that." I think that's what they call themselves. And what they're talking about is that they follow this, you know, this confession that was written out. Hey, here are the things that we believe. And I, so, what that would be is a Baptist denomination, then, if you believe in that, right? So, a lot of them are like Reformed Baptist or something like that. And we understand that that that's not what being a Baptist is about. Okay, and uh, and like I said, even among the, that acronym, there are some differences. But what they're basically saying is that there's uh, all these primary things that people have have held to throughout history that are what we would call baptistic, you know. And I'm not preaching on the Baptist distinctives, but I'm preaching on the church officers, the church officers. And so, like I said, there is one uh, teaching that's out there that says, hey, there's only two offices. That's the office of the pastor and the office of a deacon, all right? Now, as far as biblical authority goes and what the Bible says about the uh, authority given to certain people, we understand there are qualifications given, 1 Timothy, Titus, given to the bishop, right? Pastor, uh, 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 elder, you might call him. And then there are those qualifications that are assigned to a deacon, and so the idea is that, hey, these are the ones that have qualifications that are supposed to be ordained over the ministry and all those. And so, so ultimately, people say there's two offices, okay? And I understand what they're saying. But the word office can sometimes be used, and uh, we don't want to necessarily make that more than it is. Office just simply means it's the position assigned to somebody, like the job uh, that, that has, has been given to them. Let me give you a few examples. Look at Genesis 41. Genesis 41, verse 13, this is uh, 
you, you know, this is whenever Joseph is interpreting dreams and, he's, and he interpreted the, the dream, talking about the, the butler and the baker. And so now some time has gone by and he's, he's standing before Pharaoh and he's telling him about, about this, uh, this experience that he had forgotten about. And so in verse 13 it says, And it came to pass as he interpreted to us, talking about Joseph, so it was me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. And so uh, who was it talking right here? Well, uh, there was the chief baker and the chief butler. All right. And they're saying that he restored to us our offices. All right. So off, they had the office of a butler. I don't, we, could use, we could use somebody around here, the office of a butler. <laughs> we got the office of a baker. Well, we got two bakers, man, Sharice and uh, Natalia. They've been baking for us. That's the office of a baker right there. That's an important office. <laughs> All right. But that's what it means. Office is just like that's their job. That's what they did. And they had this job ascribed to them. Look at Exodus 1. Exodus 1, uh, let me see, I can't remember where, I can't remember where it was. Somewhere in here, it's talking about the midwives, I wasn't actually going to turn to it, I just, I was just going to mention it, but it said that, it talks about the office of the midwife. Anybody see that jump out at you? The office of the midwife, you get the idea though, it's in there. <laughs> But this was their office, all right? This, was what their, this is what their job was. They, any, it says, any woman who does the office of a midwife. Uh, did you see it? 16. All right, 16, thank you. Just When I'm standing here, man, and, that, and something like that happens, it, I can't find it. It's just like everything turns white to me, okay? But it says, uh, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and so this was called an office. You understand? It's just that was her job. It was the assigned the position that they were... Uh, called to do. Uh, we also see, obviously, through Exodus, Leviticus, all these, there's this office of the priest, all right, over and over. It says the office of, when they do the office of a priest, you know, uh, in that, uh, in First Chronicles, when there's talking about the temple and he's given us assigning different jobs for that, he talks about the office of the porter. Everybody know what a porter is? You think of a portal, right? That would be like a door. And so the office of a porter, you know what that is? A doorman. <laughs> And you know that's actually a position. Uh, the I I believe uh, obviously the job description has changed over the years, but there was a job in the White House. I'm sure it's still there. And this guy's job description is the porter. Okay, and there's several things that he takes care of. I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. Uh, he, and so we would compare that maybe to an usher, a, a greeter, a door greeter. You know, someone who welcomes people at the door or whatever. Uh, that's what we would say in the church today, but uh, but the Bible uses that phrase, the office of a porter, and, and talking about the uh, the temple, also the office of a king. Right, that's used throughout the Bible, and so these are different offices. Of course, that's Old Testament. You say some of those aren't even related to church. You know, they're just they're just talking about different job descriptions, and I agree with that. I'm just saying that the word office. I want you to understand kind of what that means. It doesn't mean there's some kind of special supernatural you know, uh, necessarily. Now, if that's what we're talking about, um, then yes, there are, uh, there is, and I'm going to get to this here in a, in a minute, but there, again, the, the uh, laying hands on somebody and sending them out as, a, as an evangelist, I think there's even a place for that. Laying hands on somebody and saying, hey, this is going to be the deacon of the church or uh, ordaining somebody into the ministry to be the pastor. Uh, obviously, we see Titus being told to do that, ordain elders in every city and all that. And so, yeah, I understand and I agree that there are two offices. There's the pastor and then there's the deacon. But really, there's a lot of jobs that are done inside the church. you agree with me? <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of things that we need to do. So then we get to the New Testament. We see that there was an office of an apostle. I don't believe we have that anymore. That's talking about somebody who, uh, one thing, they were actually with Christ when he was on earth. And you'll see here in a minute, it goes all the way back to uh, even some of them to John the Baptist. And, and it was kind of with them from the very beginning. But look at uh, Acts 1.20. Acts 1.20, J. 
Jesus uh, has, res- has risen from the dead, ascended up to the Father, and now the disciples are just kind of sitting around, you know, deciding what we need to do next. And Peter, of course, uh, takes uh, the lead right here. And in verse 20, he says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. All right? And uh, you go back to uh, Psalm 109, verse 8, and he says, And his office let someone else take. Okay, so we're talking about the same thing. There's Bishop Rick here or, or the office, and he's saying that you need to uh, uh, do, you know, he's talking about someone else needs to be appointed to this office. Okay, and of course they're talking about apostles or, or uh, disciples there. And so he's saying, hey, we need to appoint somebody. Let's just read what it, what it says there. Uh, Wherefore of these men, verse 21, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who uh, was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Okay, then they cast lots. Uh, It's up in the air whether or not this was the right thing to do. Were they really obeying the Holy Spirit on this or, or what the deal was, but cast lots, it falls upon Matthias, and that's another story for another day. But we see there the office of a uh, an apostle. I don't believe that we have that office anymore. Nobody was with John the Baptist. Nobody was with Christ. Now, I know there are a group of Baptists out there that say that it, it's not a true church unless you can trace it all the way back to John, John the Baptist, and I don't really think that that's even possible, okay? But there is a actually a belief out there uh, what do they call landmarkist? I think that's the same thing. Uh, but they're talking about going all the way back to the the uh, to John the Baptist. And look, I'm tell you right now, Iola Baptist Temple cannot trace their lineage all the way back to John the Baptist. All right, but I still believe that we are a church. And uh, so, but this is the office of an apostle. Uh, obviously, First Timothy three. We'll probably go there a couple times, but let's go ahead and go there now. First Timothy three. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, and he gives all the qualifications there. Titus, he says, uh, uh, similar, he says, let me see here. Uh, oh, I'm on chapter 2. Titus chapter 1, he says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest uh, set in order the things that are one. I'm in verse 5 that are wanting in ordained elders in every city as I appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having he gives, gives these qualifications. Verse 7, he says, for a bishop must be blameless. So we know bishop and elder is used interchangeably there. So when you're reading the Bible, elder, a lot of times it's talking about this uh, elder bishop position. Okay. Now we call it, uh, typically call it pastor. And I'm going to tell you, the only reason I have never embraced calling people elders or calling people bishops is because it seems weird. Because there are other, other you know, false religions out there and uh, cults and stuff like that that embrace those. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong. You know, a brother uh, Dan always calls me bishop, right? Bishop, right? And I think it's right. It's not wrong. I just personally don't ever use that. I always say pastor. The interesting thing about that is the word pastor... Uh, is only used three times in the Bible, and uh, and you know it's it's one times it's, it's just plural, and the other times it's kind of sketchy as to what exactly it's talking about. There's no concrete place where it says the pastor is the bishop or the elder. But I believe it's all three the same, okay? And and if you look up those words, what it's talking about is kind of like the role that the pastor plays. And so, uh, you know, pastor speaks about being like a shepherd. You know, he's he's overseeing the flock, and so. There are a lot of places, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul, I don't believe, was an elder or a bishop because he's the one that said these are the qualifications and he wasn't the husband of one wife, okay? So I don't believe he was a a bishop. He was an apostle and he was also, uh, you know, kind of like a missionary or we would say evangel. I mean, uh, we would say missionary, but the Bible calls the position an evangelist, I believe. So he would go out, start churches, all that kind of stuff. That doesn't make him a, 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 an elder or a bishop. Okay, so, uh, so however, in a sense, you could say he was a pastor in the sense that he led these people, loved them, he shepherded them, he cared for them and all that. Uh, but that, that 
verb about pastoring somebody just speaks about the, you know, the what it is that they're accomplishing, okay? But when we say pastor, we're talking about elder, bishop, this kind of an idea. So, but I just want to throw that out there. And so that, I don't necessarily have a problem when somebody says, uh, youth pastor or music pastor or something like that. I personally don't like it. I don't, I don't really use that because in all, my way of thinking, it's like there's one pastor. But what that means is there's one elder, there's one bishop over the church, okay? And then there's other, other uh, 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 positions in there. But, uh, s- but when somebody says a youth pastor, it doesn't have to mean like that's the youth bishop, right? the youth elder a uh, pastor could just mean that they're just leading the flock, okay? They're, they're, they're doing that. So I, I don't necessarily uh, throw a fit if somebody uses those terminology. <clears throat> but I'm getting ahead of myself because I want to explain in a little bit about that and how different churches use different titles and different positions and all that kind of stuff. I'll get there in a minute. But I just want to say that the, obviously we see the biblical office of a bishop, elder, pastor, and then the office of a deacon, Okay, and again, 1 Timothy 3 says that. The office of a deacon talks about the uh, qualifications there. Okay, so let me give you just, it's just two points, and then the conclusion, I'm just going to make some application here on the subject and how it applies to us as Iola Baptist Temple. Okay, number one, here's the first point. We are all called to the same vocation. All right, everybody in this church is called to the same vocation. Now, what does vocation mean? Basically, it's their calling. You're called with the same calling. You're called to this uh, job. We might say, uh, maybe you've heard people say that before, like, what is your vocation? You know, talking about what field of work you're in, but it has to do with more, it's like, it's like somebody saying, well, this is my calling in life. This is, this is the type of job that I'm going to do because it's my calling. And that's the idea. So when he says, uh, you've all been uh, uh, called with the same calling, look at Romans, uh, oh no, back to Ephesians chapter 4 where he read, and look at verse 1, Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now he's talking to the whole church here, the whole church of Ephesus, and he's saying to all of them, I want you to walk worthy of the vocation which you've been called. The first point I want to make is that we're all called to the same vocation. We've been given the same calling, right, as Christians and as members of the church. We literally have, I don't want to sound weird here, but we really, we literally have a destiny, okay? We've been predestined. (gasps) That's right. We've been predestined. That's a biblical word. It's okay to say that. Let's look at it. Romans 8, Romans chapter 8. We've been predestined to a vocation, Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, you know, He knew if you were going to choose to become a Christian or not. I didn't say He predestined you to be a Christian. He didn't predestine anybody certainly to, 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 to hell. You know, he didn't, des- he didn't write that for you and say, hey, I'm going to create uh, Braden here and he's going to go to hell. No, that he, doesn't, he doesn't work that way. Amen. Okay, well, he didn't predestine anybody to hell. But what he's saying is he foreknew those who were going to accept Christ, okay? Those who he foreknew, he also did predestinate. And it doesn't stop there. What did he predestinate them to? Predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So what he's saying is when God foresaw the idea of the church and those who would follow Christ and those who would become uh, one with uh, one with Christ, as Ephesians said, there's one Lord, right? There's one faith. There's one baptism. We're all talking about the same thing. You know, when we're bat- what, what one baptism means, it's not talking about being dunked in water. Now, we do that as a symbol of our baptism, but that one baptism is when we receive Christ, when we are of the faith, there's only one faith, right? Amen. Faith in Jesus Christ. We are baptized into Christ. We are one with Christ, okay? We are part of, uh, of Christ, and He's in us, and we're in Him, okay? So whom He did foreknow, He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. So this is what God's got for us as His church. 
He wants us to be conformed into the image of His Son and to, and to be Christ-like and to do certain things. And if we're doing that and, uh, and we love Him and we are following that, all things are going to work together for good, right? And so these, these, this, is the, this is what He's saying. And so He said, uh, in those who He... Let's see, where did I leave off there? Verse 29. No, verse 30. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. In whom he called, them he also justified. In whom he justified, them he also glorified. I just want you to show, just want to show you that we're all baptized into Christ whenever we get saved, and uh, and and after that we're predestined to be conformed to His image, and He's called us to a purpose. All right. Now uh, that doesn't mean everybody's going to get on board with that, but this is the calling. This is what our uh, our destiny is, okay? And everyone in their local church, and you say, why local church? You just said, everyone's, there's one baptism. Aren't we all just a universal church? Not exactly, <laughs> okay? Because this is how God ordained it, that churches would be autonomous, that churches would have, in fact, he says that they're out of order, right? Those churches that were started, he said they had to have a pastor, and so he called, or deacon, right? So he had to go, or, or elder. He had to ordain elders over all those cities, right? Because they were out of order. They weren't in the proper order. And so this is the way God planned that he that the, that his church, now I'm not going to say universal, but the church that Christ started, okay? When Christ started the church, you know, he, he, he got baptized of John the Baptist. He chose out 12 disciples. I mean, you could just go down the line of everything that he did. He was actually beginning the church. Right? Now, later on, those, that, they spread out and started all these different churches, but they didn't have this one like uh, denomination necessarily where they had somebody over them. Hey, they, orda they began ordaining elders over all these places. I'm talking about after the uh, resurrection. And so, uh, so anyway, so the local church, when I say that, that's part of God's plan too, all right? That we would be part of a church, and I'm going to show you in a minute some verses on that, okay? But that we would be part of that church, and according to what we read here in Ephesians 4, let's read it again. Ephesians 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore the prisoner uh, of the Lord beseech you that you should walk worthy of the vocation wherein ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are all called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given a grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up unto high, he led the captives captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might uh, fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for, now this is why he's doing it, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is why we meet. This is what we're called to. This is what God has predestined for us to do as a church is that the saints would be perfected, right? Nothing wrong with preaching against sin. Nothing wrong with calling people to holiness and saying, hey, this is how we have to live. That doesn't make us a teaching work salvation. No, it's just saying, hey, now that you're saved, you need to start getting with the program and living for the Lord and, and uh, doing the things you're supposed to do. Look, perfecting of the saints. Look at this one. The work of the ministry. What is the work of the ministry other than taking the gospel to the world and, and, and expounding the Bible to people so that they can see how to be saved? And uh, that's no doubt the work of the ministry. And, uh, and then finally, the edifying of the body of Christ. Hey, we all need to be edified. We need to continue to meet together, sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, as Colossians 3 talks about, uh, and Ephesians, uh, was it 5 or 6? And uh, we need to be, 6, we need to be encouraging one another, exhorting one another, admonishing one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. This is part of uh, edifying the body. 
Okay? So we're all called to the same vocation. We all have basically the same job. That is to find out how we can help contribute to the perfecting of the saints. We can help contribute to the work of the ministry. We can help uh, contribute to the edifying of the body of Christ. This, we're all, we all got the same job, the same vocation. Okay? But the second thing that I want to show you is that, yes, some positions are more visual, visible, I should say, and more recognized than other positions, all right? But no position is more important than the other position. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. No position is more important than the other position. Because we all have the same job, right? We're all part of the same body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 12. 12, 12. For as the body is one... And hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if there were all one member, I'm sorry, if they were all one member, uh, where were the body? But now are they many members? Yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body uh, which we think to be less honorable, among those uh, we bestow more uh, abundant honor, and our comely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked, lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Look, I'm going to tell you this. As a runner, I could say, hey, here's the only thing that I got to have strong lungs, right? That's imperative. I got to have a, a good heart that's pounding, and I got to have strong legs, all right? And that's it. No, I can tell you this, man, you need a strong knee. <laughs> I've been having knee problems in that little bitty member right there. You know, that'll stop me from being able to function as I'm supposed to function as a runner, okay? I'm called to a much higher calling than running. But you understand what I'm saying? The body has got to have every single member, you know? It's got to have a, 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 a stomach. It's got to have uh, kidneys that are continuing to process uh uh, this the, the the nutrients and and filter out the water all that all that kind of stuff the toxins and and our bodies are so complex but you know that I love that illustration there you're saying not everybody wants to be the eye man that's the important part right everybody wants to be uh, the uh, uh, the ears you know hearing is so important yeah but you need every single part of the body working together and the thing is we're all equally important because we're all equally trying to accomplish the same things. So if we had a church, and I'm not saying it by any means that we do, but if we had a church where everybody would just came here and they all wanted to be the pastor, well, that's going to be a problem, <laughs> right? It's too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Everybody wants to be the leader. They want to be, you know, calling the shots. Uh, or maybe not the pastor, but they say, well, yeah, but I want to be the second man. I want to be the man that calls the shots underneath the pastor and, and have a higher position and all that stuff. We would be all out of order, Right? Just as much as we'd be out of order if we didn't have a pastor, we not only need a pastor, but we need certain people fulfilling certain jobs. And look, I don't know what all the jobs are, but but God is, uh, according to the Bible, Jesus left certain gifts and certain abilities that people have so that they could be part of this body and allow the body to be uh, working together. So some characteristics of these positions that seem to be higher positions, and the only reason they're higher is because, you know, like you got to have certain checks and balances and you have to have certain qualifications for a person to, to do a certain role 
which again, doesn't make them more important than anybody else. My job is not, a lot of pastors get kind of big heads about their authority, but my job, and I have to recognize this, I hope I never forget this, but my job is not any more important than any single one in here, even the least among you, even the youngest, right? Everybody's equally uh, working towards the same, uh, same goal. And so it's, it's, but, but at the same time, there's obviously going to be some qualifications before somebody can be a pastor, obviously going to be some qualifications before somebody can become a deacon. But the point that I'm making is just that one position is not more important than the other. Okay. But I want to look at this Exodus 18, Exodus 18. Verse 21. And this is when uh, Jethro talked to his father-in-law Moses and said, Hey, man, you're just wearing yourself out. You're wearing the people out. Because he was just like one man doing everything. And, uh, and it was almost like, well, God called me to this job, and so I'm going to do it. And I'm not going to ask anybody to help me uh, because he called me to do it. And Jethro says, well, that doesn't even make sense. You're gonna, you can't handle all this, and you're not going to be able to do that. And so he recommends to him that he appoints different people to help take on this job. And here's what I want you to notice in verse 21, Exodus 18, verse 21. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. I mean, that's pretty key, isn't it? Whatever job I'm going to put somebody over, i got to make sure they're able to do that job. Able men such as fear God. Now, any work in the, in, in the church, if somebody's going to be given a job, they better fear the Lord, right? They better not just be living in sin and, and rebelling against God and saying, hey, I don't care what God's going to, you know, what God thinks of this or whatever. And look, I don't even care if somebody comes and like they just are, are great soul winners and they're like, hey, I just want to go out and I just want to win souls. Look, you can win souls and I would never stop anybody from winning souls. But if you want to get involved in the church and be part of the church, you know, there are more prerequisites than just being able to win souls, right? There are uh, some things that I'm going to check. Is this person really fearing God? You know, is this person really, uh, is he just going to be flipping about how he lives his life outside of this church and get into all manners of wickedness? Look, the Bible says, I mean, 1 Corinthians 5, look, there are some people that need to be put out from among us for being drunkards, extortioners, fornicators, all this kind of stuff. Look, it's really serious that we make sure that the people that are getting involved and the people that we're putting into certain positions and all that, uh, not that one's more important than the other, because look, everybody in here ought to fear God, don't you think? Everybody in here ought to be living right. It's not just the people that have a, 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 a position that everybody sees, you know. Everybody ought to be doing that. But, uh, but if you're going to pick somebody to be have a, a, a place of uh, authority or have to make certain judgment calls or being put over a certain job, well, obviously you want to make sure that they fear God, uh, they're able. Look what it says next. Men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, right? I think, I'm getting ahead of myself, okay, but I think, hey, tens, you know, a, one person can pretty much handle tens, right? Now, once you get into like 50s, you know, this is a pretty good rule of thumb. Once you get to 50 people, it starts getting out of your control and you need some people to stand in and to, and to be able to do certain jobs, right? But look, again, Everybody, even if you want to use this analogy and you go back to the, to, to the people in this day and the children of Israel, like everyone had a job to do. It wasn't just the Levites, right? Everybody had to follow the Lord. Everybody had to stay clean. They all had sacrifices that they had to make. They had certain rules that they were supposed to follow. Everybody was held accountable for that. They were all part of a community basically in that day. And, uh, and so it wasn't just the priests and all that, that kind of stuff. But obviously he wanted to put men in charge who had these qualifications. Look at Acts uh, chapter 6. I know this isn't new. I've, I've even touched on this before, but some recent, recent conversations came up that made me think like, hey, maybe it's time to go over this again. Maybe uh, not super clear. And this is where the application is going to come at the conclusion here. But I want to go over these things again as far as what an office is. 
Some people, I think, make more out of that than it is. So what did I say? Acts chapter 6. So a similar thing happens in Acts that we saw with Moses. Now we've got the apostles. And remember, on the day of Pentecost, 5,000 people got saved in one day and were added to the church, right? 3,000. Later on, it was 5,000. And so we're talking about thousands of people meeting together, uh, you know, at that part of the church. Now, I don't believe that they all met in the same place every day, you know, house to house, right? Daily they met in the temple and house to house. So you got, you know, 3,000 people, right, following each other around. How are we going to cram into your house tomorrow? <laughs> We're going to cram into the... I don't think that's what he meant, okay? But he's just saying that... that Daily as the church, they, their job was to go get the work done. And so daily they were meeting together in a temple. They were meeting house to house. They were doing everything they can to meet and to uh, and talk about the Lord. Now, I think there were times where they all met together as an assembly, you know, and they in, in, in we certainly see places where the first day of the week they met together. They even took up collections, the Bible talks about, and, uh, and they met together to, uh, uh, to, to pray and to sing songs and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so obviously that's where we get uh, our current practices. But how did I get off on that? What was I talking about? Okay, so, so anyway, so in the early church, though, they had all these people, and they were trying to take care of people. Uh, some of them had, hey, hey, man, I'm giving all my time to the church. Uh, I sold all my possessions, and, and I'm just full-time working in the church. And they're saying, hey, well, we got some widows that need to be taken care of. And it was just like a constant chore. Like they were so much involved in just making sure everybody was taken care of and they were fed. And they were... and so the apostles, and there's there was 11 of them, 12 if you count Matthias, and they're, and they're like, they had a lot of things to do. They had a lot of things on their plate. Think about this. Like we all got Bibles. We can go to the dollar store and get a Bible. Somebody... Uh, you just talked about your soul winning, and then somebody comes out with a with a Bible, King James Bible from the dollar store. They're, it's just abundant in the United States. We can get a King James Bible anywhere. But back then, man, they they were they were writing the Bible out by hand, making sure it was accurate, and uh, and they were getting it out to different places. Not only that, they're going out and they're preaching the gospel. They even had additional uh, uh, gifts that we don't have today, which is another message, but like like healing people and doing signs and miracles and all this. And these were all different works of the ministry that they had. And they were going out uh, uh, serving the Lord in this way. And here's what it says in chapter 6, verse 1, Acts chapter 6. And in those days when the number of the multi uh, disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. I'm not saying they were above serving tables or that, hey, we're so much higher and more important than the per people that, you know, are, are feeding the widows and all that. No, they all had the same job. You see what I'm saying? It's all equally important. They're just saying, look, our job is to give ourselves fully to praying and to uh, ministering the word and all that stuff. And, and it's just a little bit too much on our plate to go deal with crowds and crowds of, of people and, uh, and visiting them and taking care of their, their uh, needs and feeding them. So he says, wherefore, brethren, verse three, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. That sounds very familiar to what Moses was looking for in Exodus. Whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples, disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient in the faith. Anyway, so, uh, so we see there in the early church that began to grow and began to grow, they said, hey, we need to get organized and appoint certain people over certain businesses, and we want to make sure that there are people who are of honest report, right? Remember what Moses said, or what it said in Exodus, it said, honest men, Right and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, he said in the same thing in, in Exodus. He said people that are uh, uh, able men, 
right? And, uh, and fear the Lord. And so, I mean, we're talking about the same kind, just somebody who, who fits the bill. Now, the people chose out from among them who these people were, but who was it that ultimately said, all right, these are it. We're going to appoint them. Hey, they have our approval. It was the apostles, right? It was the ones who were, uh, who were over that and had the, had the authority. So in the same way, I think that it's the pastor of each church, pastor, bishop, elder, whatever you want to call them, that has to verify like, hey, this is the person that I'm going to appoint to be in charge. Right now, if somebody got bent out of shape about that, like, well, why are these people put in charge? Like, why isn't it me? Well, that shows number one a real uh, lack of maturity in that person to think like, no, it needs to be me or something like that. And so, like, you just got to trust that the leader uh, is hopefully seeking the wisdom of God and saying, hey, I see in these people uh, that they are the most able to be able to do this job. They have showed and demonstrated that they fear the Lord and they love the Lord and they want to do this. And, and, uh, and, and so I have, as the pastor, put them over these, these positions. Now, here's the thing about that, though. <clears throat> what are the offices? This is just conclusion now. We're, I'm just about done. What are the officers that we have at Iola Baptist Temple? Anybody know? <laughs> well, we got the pastor. What's the other office that we have? Well, if you're talking about the office of a deacon, we don't have that right now. Like we got, we're, we, we, if we put both congregations together, Iola and Kansas City Work, put them together, we wouldn't even have 50 people, right? We, we probably wouldn't even have 40 <laughs> if we all met together. Now, I, look, I've had, you could say, well, that's humiliating. That's not the way I want it. I want it to be more than that. But the reality is that's not there. So we really don't have this huge need to just like micromanage and have all these different offices and all that kind of stuff. And if somebody came and said, yeah, but I was at a church and they did it this way, who cares? <laughs> You're at this church now. You know? Yeah, but I think that this would be the best. You're not the pastor. <laughs> okay. So, so when we are considering this, uh, look, the church that we're a part of right now, we've all got the same job. And there's one guy that's over it all uh, who has the authority to, to decide whether or not it's time to put somebody over a certain uh, position, okay? Now, I will say this. In, I, in Iola, Iola Baptist Temple was started in 1952. They have articles of faith. They have bylaws. The bylaws say, hey, this is the way we're going to uh, run. This is how we're going to organize. And there's some legal ramifications of that, and there's some reasons that they have to have certain people in place. And, and so according to the bylaws of Iola Baptist Temple, you know, it says in there, like, this is the job of the trustees. This is the job of, of these different people. And so in a manner of speaking, we do have, according to our bylaws, in place trustees. All right. But at the time, I only have one trustee. That's Brother Rob. The other trustee was Brother Webb, and he passed away, all right? So in Iola, I don't have uh, even, according to our bylaws, right, the, the amount of people that I'm supposed to have. But look, a trustee, like their job description is basically uh, they can sign off for something, like a bank decision, or, or most of the time they don't, even really, <laughs> they don't even really need that. I can, as the pastor, take care of pretty much everything, but a trustee... I would say that one good thing about that is to have accountability, to have somebody to go to as a pastor, as some counsel and all that kind of stuff. But, a, but we have trustees. There's an office of a treasurer, right? We had a treasurer. He decided he didn't want to be a member at the church anymore, and he, and he moved up and he went off to uh, the church where a lot of people went to after they left <laughs> Iowa Baptist Temple. And it's okay. If they're serving the Lord there, I'm fine with it. But my point is that we lost him. I've got a couple people there in Iola that probably, you know, maybe I could put them over the, the finances, but we haven't got there yet. I, didn't, I don't think it's important. You know, every quarter I go before and I show all the records, all the, uh, for the most part, all the, uh, I mean, I don't give every little single detail, but all the checks that have been written, all the uh, purchases that have been made, it's all there. Anybody can double check me and all that stuff, but I'm able to do that. Every Monday, count the money put it in the bank, you know, for, keep all the records and all that. 
It's pretty simple. So we don't even actually have a treasure. I do want to get a treasure. I not only want to get a treasure there, I want to get a treasure here and keep everything separate. But that's another, uh, that's another story. Now, I believe that's a, an office of sorts, somebody that I need to do that job, that I want to put them over that at some point whenever we're ready to, to make that step. We also have a, a church clerk. Uh, Miss Ruth is the church clerk, and her job is to just record the things that go on as far as business matters, somebody joining the church, if someone gets baptized. She's, uh, if we have a business meeting, she's supposed to record some of that just so that we have good records. All right, So she's, she's, uh, she's over that. Anything that's done here, technically, it doesn't always happen, but anything that's done here, we take that information back. It gets written into the books and all that stuff. Remember, we're just one church, Iola Baptist Temple at this point, okay? And so, uh, and so this is our offices. We don't have a Sunday school superintendent. We don't even, we're not even really doing Sunday school right now. We don't have an assistant pastor, a youth pastor, a music director. Uh, these are some things that other churches have. You know, some people, sometimes those positions, they're paid staff. Well, that would be nice, but we're just not there. There's no need for it right now, right? We've got volunteers stepping up, and we got a small enough crowd that we don't have to appoint somebody to that. We don't have uh, uh, some of these kind of different, some of these different uh, positions. Now we take, we basically have the pastor, right, and the people that I say, hey, man, I need some help on this. For this work here, I go to Brother Stevie for a lot of things. Uh, he's just a guy I like to bounce ideas off. I think he's fit for that job. And uh, in, in Iola, it's Brother Rob. You know, One thing, Brother Rob's been there longer than anybody else. He's familiar with the history of the church. Kind of like the apostle said, hey, we got to find somebody to, uh, to replace Judas. So we're going to go all the way back to somebody that's been here, all the way with us from John the Baptist and... And as Jesus went in and out from among us, you know, someone has been with us the whole time. I think it's a great idea to have somebody in charge of a church that knows the history of the church. And they've been with the church since the beginning and they understand the, the, the workings, inner workings of it. And they know the history of certain people that have come and gone. And they're, you know, in the area and able to take care of uh, uh, certain things whenever we need uh, them to be taken care of. So anyway, but the point is, we don't have a reason to push for, hey, I need to assign everybody these titles and get all like micromanage and all that stuff. I just don't think it's there yet. But there's no doubt there's going to come a time where it's needed. You know, we will need uh, certain people to take on certain responsibilities. But right now, it doesn't matter. We're all doing the same job. We're all doing the same job. What, what is it? Perfect the saints, right? What's your job? I mean, what is your role? What can you do to help? perfect the saints. Do it. You know, if you think you're stepping over some bounds and, hey, man, I, I really need to make sure this is okay with the pastor, come talk to me about it. But for the most part, if you're doing something that you think is going to help to perfect the saints and you're not going out of line, do it. The work of the ministry. I'm so glad to be part of a church where so many people go out soul winning, knocking on doors, exhorting people and telling them, uh, you know, what the Bible says and and, uh, and, and signing up to preach and signing up to edify one another. They can get up here and they can lead singing. They can uh, do all these things for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Right? We need to be edified. Uh, and and certain, you, certain you guys help each other out with that, sharing verses with each other, uh, sharing preaching with each other that you guys have, have listened to. Hey, this is a great message. You need to listen to this. All these things, man, we're doing the same job. Right? I'm the pastor, yes. I'm over this. I've got the final say over certain things, but we're all working together. We're not one person more important than the other person. And that doesn't matter if it's here or if it's in Iola. It's same thing. Same thing. We're all got the same job. And I hope one day to be able to appoint people over. Uh, but I think I would say we at least need 50 people <laughs> to be coming regularly uh, before we need to start thinking about what the next step is as far as uh, as far as that goes. So I hope that understands. Maybe, maybe you guys already knew this, doesn't clarify anything, but sometimes it gets uh, easy for somebody to walk in and be like, well, this is how this other church does it that I know. Well, we're not that other church, <laughs> right? This is, this is where we are, and uh, this is what we're doing. And so you're going to have to trust your pastor and trust the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I do pray that you'll help us as your church to, uh, to do what's best for 
uh, for the kingdom uh, and uh, for edifying the saints and and uh, the work of the ministry, all these things, Lord. I pray that you'll help us each recognize our importance. And Lord, uh, if we want to uh, see this grow to a larger work that requires more organization and everything, Lord, help us all do our part to get there and, uh, and, and keep getting people saved and go back and trying to get them in here to be discipled and, and, uh, and just to, to all be a part of that work and not to just sit back and see what, what we can get out of the preaching and, and, uh, and how our needs can be met, but that we would just be busy about doing the work. And, uh, and we all got the same job, Lord. Uh, we're, we're, we're all following you, and we look to uh, uh, Jesus. I uh, pray that you'll give us wisdom and strength to do your work. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.